On the 11th of October 1925, Edwin C. Shanahan became the first FBI agent to be unalived in the line of duty. That day, Special Agent Shanahan sought to apprehend Martin James Durkin, a professional car thief, for violation of the National Motor Vehicle Theft Act. Martin James Duncan was born on the 16th of February 1901, and he passed away on the 25th of May 1981. He was known as an American criminal and car thief. He is credited as the first man to unalive a federal agent and was the subject of an intense manhunt by the FBI. Durkin had a long record. He had previously shot and wounded three policemen in Chicago and also had shot and wounded a fourth police officer in California. He had already attained a reputation as a desperate gunman who would shoot an unalive upon meeting the slightest interference in his activities. Special Agent Shanahan had received confidential information that a man sought to be Durkin was due to arrive at a certain garage in Mexico with a stolen car that he had transported to that city from New Mexico. Special Agent Shanahan procured proper assistance and proceeded to the garage in question. After all day, it appeared that the information was inaccurate and that Durkin would not come into the garage as has been expected. Whether the police officers with Special Agent Shanahan had momentarily left the garage for the purpose of seeking another detail of officers to relieve them, Durkin drove in with a stolen car. Special Agent Shanahan attempted to take him into custody, but Durkin swept a revolver from the front seat of the stolen car and shot Shanahan through the breast. Personally led by J. Edgar Hoover, then recently appointed director of the FBI, it was one of the first major investigations by the agency, who were led by Durkin on a three-month chase through the five states before his capture in 1926. In late 1925, Durkin came under investigation by federal authorities for violation of the Dyer Act. 1919, the Dyer Act, properly known as the National Motor Vehicle Theft Act, made in to state transportation of stolen vehicles a federal crime. A professional car thief, the 25-year-old was suspected of transporting stolen cars across state lines. On the 11th of October 1925, Durkin was followed to a Chicago garage by federal special agent Edwin C. Shanahan. When Shanahan approached the car Durkin was in, he surprised him and Duncan shot him in the chest. The story received instant national attention because Shanahan was the first agent to be unalived in the line of duty. The reaction from the FBI was particularly aggressive and widely considered a matter of pride and personal security among virtually the entire agency. According to popular law, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover called an aide to his office after hearing the news of Shanahan's unaliving and said, We've got to get Dirk in. If one man from the Bureau is killed and the killer is permitted to get away, our agents will never be safe. We can't let him get away with it. Hoover authorised one of the first and largest manhunts in the FBI's history, which stretched across the country and included several major cities. Durkin did not immediately flee Chicago and remained in the city until eventually travelling to California. Federal agents followed him to California, where he was involved in a San Diego car theft, and then to Arizona, New Mexico and Texas. In El Paso, Durkin was stopped by a local sheriff who noticed Durkin carrying a pistol. He was then travelling with his girlfriend in a stolen Cadillac, but falsely claimed that he was a deputy sheriff from California and was passing through on vacation. The sheriff allowed Durkin to retrieve his police identification from a nearby hotel but they instead took the opportunity to escape by driving into the Texas desert. The FBI soon arrived in El Paso shortly after Durkin's abandoned car was found wrecked and partially buried in Mesquite. Investigators found a rancher who recalled a man and a woman who had shown up at his home and asked for a lift to the nearest town. He agreed to drive them to Gervin and remembered overhearing a conversation the couple had which suggested they planned to catch a train in Alpine, Texas, the seat in Brewster County. 
Although only 50 miles from the Mexican border, authorities believe that Durkin would remain in the United States and most likely arrange travel to a large metropolitan area. A railroad ticket agent in Alpine identified Durkin as the man who had bought railroad tickets from him to San Antonio and from there to St. Louis. Durkin had already boarded the train to St. Louis on the day of the 20th of January 1926 and was scheduled to arrive in the city at 11am the same day. Investigators immediately phoned the FBI office in Missouri to intercept him and cooperating with St. Louis police, he had stopped at a small town just outside the St. Louis city limits. With the station surrounded on all sides by open farmland, there was little chance for Durkin to escape and the train was boarded by federal agents and police officers who arrested the fugitive in his private compartment before he could reach for his guns. Durkin confessed that an Ivan of Shanahan wants in custody but... As a live enough FBI agent was not yet a federal crime, he was tried and convicted in the state of Illinois for murder and sentenced to 35 years imprisonment. Durkin was then tried in federal court where he received 15 additional years for violations of the Diet Act, but they were unable to prosecute him for the unaliving of Shanahan. Durkin spent almost 20 years at the Illinois State Prison and after his release on the 8th of August 1945, he was transferred to Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary where he remained until his parole on the 28th of July 1954. Durkin passed away in 1981. On the 28th of October 1925, at 11.13pm, Sergeant Harry Gray and his officers went to Lloyd Irvin Austin Sr.'s apartment and asked if they could wait inside for Durkin. Austin gave permission and the officers stationed themselves in the second floor rear apartment and awaited Durkin's arrival. In addition to the officers inside the apartment, several officers were stationed throughout the neighbourhood. As Durkin arrived, accompanied with his girlfriend Elizabeth Grace Betty Andrews, Sergeant Gray arrested him. However, a struggle between the two ensued. During the fight, Sergeant Michael Norton pointed his shotgun at Durkin and as he pulled the trigger, Sergeant Gray fell against Durkin. His blast grazed Durkin's left arm with the rest of the slugs going through the wall and into a closet where Austin Lloyd was hiding. Austin Lloyd was struck and mortally wounded. In relation for her uncle being shot, Betty Andrews produced a revolver and fired fatally wounding Sergeant Gray. Durkin would also be shot during the struggle, but was unhurt as he was wearing a bulletproof vest. Lloyd Austin was taken to the hospital where he passed away the next day. Sergeant Gray was taken to Mercy Hospital where his wife was already a patient. She sat at his bedside until he succumbed to his wounds five days later at 5.15am on the 2nd of November 1925. Sergeant Gray's last words were reported as... Oh, if Norton had only known how to use a shotgun, or if he had let me take it. As a result of this atrocious unaliving, all the forces of the FBI throughout the country were concentrated in the effort to effect Durkin's capture. A few weeks after the unaliving of Shanahan, information was received that Durkin and a woman with whom he had been living would appear in Chicago at the home of a relative of the woman. Police officers of the Chicago Police Department attempted to arrest Durkin when he arrived at the house late at night. In the gunfight which followed, a police officer was unalived and another wounded. Durkin again escaped. Durkin's racket was stealing an interstate transportation of high-powered cars, which he sold after all the numbers thereon had been changed. The cars in which he was particularly fond of stealing were Pierce Arrows, Cadillacs and Packards. His favourite system in stealing such cars was to present himself as a prospective buyer at a dealership which handled these expensive cars. There he would bargain on the purchase of a high-priced car and would agree to buy the same, arranging to have the car serviced and filled with gasoline and oil, ready for delivery for him the following day. He would agree to return the following day and pay cash for the car. That night, he would burglarise the garage of the dealership in question and drive the expensive car away. He would then change the motor, serial number and other assembly numbers by means of which the car could be identified. 
Next, he would procure license plates and assumed names given fictitious addresses. He would then drive the car to another state where he would dispose of it for several thousand dollars. Special agents of the FBI carefully notified dealerships for such expensive cars throughout the United States as to the method employed by Durkin in these thefts. On the 10th of January 1926, as a result of this careful and systematic covering of the entire country, a Cadillac dealership at San Diego, California informed the Los Angeles office of the FBI that, on the night before, a new Cadillac Fintan with brown California top, green body and green wooden wheels had been stolen from their showroom under the circumstances identical with the system employed by Durkin. The motor, serial and other assembly numbers on this stolen Cadillac were procured by the FBI agents. In an effort to stop this car on the theory that perhaps the thief driving it might be Martin Durkin, all roads leading from California to the eastern section of the United States were covered. This systematic covering of all highways was conducted by Bureau agents in field offices at Los Angeles, Phoenix, Arizona, Denver, Colorado, El Paso, San Antonio and Dallas, Texas and Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. The transcontinental highways leading east were covered by shotgun squads day and night for almost a week to no avail. The Cadillac failed to appear. On Sunday the 17th of January 1926, a sheriff in the town of Pesos, Texas noticed a green Cadillac parked on the streets. He accosted the young man who was at the wheel and asked him to identify himself. The young man was a very smooth talker and did not present the appearance of a hard-boiled gunman and an aliver. He convincingly told the sheriff that he was Fred Connolly and that he was a deputy sheriff at Los Angeles, California. He also told the sheriff that he'd been employed at Los Angeles as a movie actor and that he was en route east with his wife. The sheriff asked him to produce papers showing ownership of the Cadillac and the young man stated that those papers were in his luggage at the hotel. He told the sheriff that he would be glad to go and get them and bring them back to the sheriff's office. The sheriff carefully observed the Cadillac before permitting this. He took a record of the motor number, license number and other assembly numbers on the car and noticed in particular that it had red wooden wheels. The young man was carrying a pistol and had a 44 Winchester in the car all of which lent colour to a story that he was a Los Angeles deputy sheriff. Being disarmed by the innocent appearance and glib talk, the sheriff permitted him to go to the hotel in Pesos for the purpose of procuring and exhibiting the papers certifying ownership of the Cadillac. When the young man described himself as Mr Fred Connolly, a deputy sheriff from Los Angeles, did not return immediately with the papers, the sheriff proceeded to the hotel where he discovered that Mr Connolly had hurriedly entered the hotel, seized his baggage and accompanied by the woman with whom he was registered, departed from Pesos at high speed in the Cadillac. Efforts made by the sheriff that day failed to effect the capture of Mr Connolly in his Cadillac car, which the sheriff now believed to be stolen. Numerous car thieves had been captured by the sheriff at Pesos, Texas, and he believed that this was just another thief and did not, at the time, connect him with Martin Durkin, the Chicago gunman for whom a 1000 reward was outstanding. However, on this Sunday, the 17th of January 1926, the sheriff wrote a letter to the field office of the FBI at El Paso, Texas, describing the incident and ended his communication with a comment to the effect that the FBI might have something on this bird. The special agent in charge of the office at El Paso, Texas, immediately recognised the physical description contained in this letter as being that of Martin Durkin, the unaliver uh, of special agent Shanahan. The Cadillac touring car, which had been stolen in Los Angeles, bore assembly numbers entirely different from those on the Cadillac car examined by the sheriff at Pesos, Texas. 
The wheels of the car driven by Mr Connolly were red, whereas the wheels on the car stolen in San Diego had been green. However, Mr Connolly had evaded the sheriff of Pesos bore earmarks of Durkin's methods of operation. There was no doubt in the minds of the bureau operators at El Paso that they were on the right trail. The telegraph and telephone wires were kept hot both east and west in the effort to stop this Cadillac car driven by Mr Connolly and his female companion. Bureau agents now had the benefit of the change of assembly numbers as well as the licence number on the stolen car. Special agents were dispatched from El Paso to comb the country in the remote western section of Texas known as the Big Bend of the Rio Grande. As a result of an all-day search through the cactus and sagebrush of those remote regions, the stolen car was found deserted in a clump of desert mesquite trees about 50 miles west from Fort Stockton, Texas. The deserted Cadillac was found late in the afternoon of the 19th of January. The right rear wheel was broken off. The fleeing and alive had the misfortune to get a punctured tyre and, because of the high rate of speed at which he'd been travelling, had lost the brand new extra tyre from the rack in the rear of the car. In desperation, he had continued driving on a flat tyre with the result that the spokes of the wheel had finally broken and he could proceed no further. Tests by the Bureau agents positively identified the Cadillac as the one which had been stolen at San Diego. A hurried investigation revealed information from a rancher nearby that he had hauled the smooth-talking stranger and the good-looking woman with him to the small town in Gervin, Texas. The stranger had said they were going to catch a train at Alpine, Texas in the Davis Mountains about 150 miles to the south near the Mexican border. Special agents of the Bureau, knowing the fondness of Martin Durkin, for the big cities and nightclubs, were not fooled into believing that he had entered Mexico. They believed that he would not care to undergo the hardships of desert travel in that bandit-infested region. Accordingly, the ticket agent of the Southern Pacific Railway in the village of Alpine, Texas, was immediately interviewed. Information was obtained from him that a strange man and a woman had boarded the Southern Pacific train number 1110 at 12.12am on Monday the 18th of January 1926 for San Antonio, Texas. From the train dispatchers of the Southern Pacific, information was immediately obtained as to the names and addresses of the train conductor and Pullman conductor who had ridden Southern Pacific train number 1110 through Alpine on the night in question. The railroad conductor was found at his home in El Paso and he identified the photograph of Durkin as being the man who got on his train at Alpine at midnight on the 18th and gave a good description of the woman with him. He furnished additional information indicating that Durkin had talked to the Pullman conductor concerning possible connections out of San Antonio, Texas for other points. It was ascertained that the Pullman conductor in question was, on the night of inquiry, en route on another train between San Antonio and Dallas. On the morning of the 20th of January 1926, special agents from Dallas and San Antonio field office obtained information that a couple using the same baggage check numbers as those which had been used by Durkin and his lady companion out of Alpine, Texas, had secured transportation out of San Antonio, Texas on the Texas special of the MK and T Railroad, then en route to St. Louis, Missouri and due to arrive there the same morning at 11am. The Pullman conductor of Southern Pacific train number 1110 upon being interviewed positively identified photographs of Durkin. He also stated that Durkin upon boarding the train at Alpine had immediately inquired as to the quickest connection out of San Antonio for St. Louis and had been told that the first and best connection was the above described Texas special. At about daylight on the morning of the 20th of January, special agents of the FBI at St. Louis, Missouri were notified that Martin Durkin and his mysterious woman companion were in a stateroom in the car of the Texas Special of the KT due to arrive there in the morning at 11am. The services of the City Detective Bureau of the St. Louis Police Department was procured 
and through appropriate arrangements, the Texas Special was stopped at a small town near St. Louis, where the fugitive and Aliva would have no chance to escape except by running on foot through ploughed fields. The train was surrounded and the Bureau agents, accompanied by St. Louis City detectives, dragged the desperate gunman from his stateroom and placed him in handcuffs before he had the opportunity to reach for the weapons that were in his luggage and overcoat. Because it was not a federal offence to an alive special agent until 1934, Durkin was tried and convicted in the state court for the unaliving of Agent Shanahan and was sentenced to serve a term of 35 years in the penitentiary at Joliet, Illinois. He was also tried in the Federal Court of Chicago for the interstate transportation of numerous cars in violation of the National Motor Vehicle Theft Act. He was convicted on all charges and was given a term of imprisonment in the Federal Penitentiary totaling 15 years. Durkin was 25 years of age when he entered the Seville Penitentiary at Joliet, Illinois in 1926. In 1946, he was taken to Leavenworth Federal Prison. He was 53 when he was released upon expiration of sentence on the 28th of July 1954. He passed away in 1981.